to God be the glory. You're welcome once again to the presence of the Lord. You can find me in the Word. Here I am. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I know that you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning to hear what the Lord has to say to you. I will hear what the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people and his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. You know, the Bible says that at this period time, people will come to church, but they will never listen to God's word. But the psalmist says here, yeah, I will hear. It's, it's something that you have to choose to do. And I believe that everyone that is hearing me today will listen attentively to what God has to say. Because every time God speaks, I'm going to decrease so that the word of God will increase. So, you know, face your screen and look at you know, what the Lord is saying to you. You're hearing and you are seeing at the same time. Every time God speaks, there are things we must not return to. Those things are called folly. Every time God speaks, there are things we must not return to. And there are things we must get into. That is peace. All right? It will speak peace to his people. All right? Those things referred to as peace are those things that the Lord wants us to get into. And things that God wants to remove from our lives are the things he called folly. This should be a sign to you. Every time you return to what the word has revealed, you should depart from. You have wasted the word. I want to repeat that. Every time you return to what the word has revealed, you should depart from, you have wasted the word. And the other side is true also, that every time God speaks the word, and you do not see any new realm you have to get into, you have wasted the word. That for that 50 minutes of message, you found nothing new to add to your life. You have wasted the word. Because the word of God by design is not sent for you to remain the same unless your heart condition is not right. In the book of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus Christ told us four types of heart. You know, according to the word, the wayside heart, people that lack understanding, the stony heart, right? The thorny heart. You know, the word falls among other things that you are thinking about, and it shocks the word. And then the good heart. You want to hear the word of God with a good heart. So the word of God, by design, is not sent for you to remain the same unless your heart condition is not right. That was the case of a woman called Lydia in Acts chapter 16, verse 14. One who had us, Apostle Paul was talking about her, one who had us, was a woman named Lydia from the city of Tyatara, a seller of purple, who was a worshiper of God. Now listen, the Lord opened our hearts to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened our heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Oh, Father, I thank you 
for giving me this wonderful opportunity to stand before your people today. Lord, I pray that you will open their hearts to pay attention to what you have sent me to say. And I pray that you move us from where we are to where we are supposed to be. You move us from the place of folly to a place of peace. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our 11th week in our Tactical Advantage series, which is based on the fact that God has given us a tactical advantage over the world system. It is an exposition of Psalm 91, which is very relevant to the time we are in and full of nuggets of wisdom to navigate us through it with the peace of God that passes all understanding and with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Once again, I will enjoin you to go on YouTube to listen to parts 1 to 10 of this series by subscribing to our channels on gfmhigh.org slash live. I said something last week which I want to use as a template, you know, for uh, the message of today. I said in contemporary times, I believe that COVID-19 pandemic would have a significant impact on how we live, work, relate, and worship congregationally. The post-COVID world would be significantly different from the pre-COVID world for those that can discern accurately. Those who refuse to make the necessary shifts would pay significantly for it. Things will never remain the same with us, and we must be ready to make the necessary shifts. I believe that pre-COVID, the church derailed from the covenant pathway, because I believe there was an amalgamation of the world views and God's view. We went into syncretism. Well, through this season, God creates the opportunity to go back to the Bible and make things right as individuals and as a corporate body. And as a watchman in the body of Christ, I must sound an alarm to sensitize us to these prophetic realities, point us to areas of extremities, and remind us of God's views to heal our backsliding. Like I've always said, go back to the Bible. It's not a cliche, but the solution to the problems confronting the 21st century church. There is a problem that I want to talk to us about that we have to correct. It happened pre-COVID, but we have to correct the problem post-COVID. And that is the juvenilization of the church. The juvenilization of the church. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 5, 12 to 14, Hebrews Chapter 5, 12 to 14. It said, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, you remain a juvenile. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Listen to that. Have their senses 
exercised by reason of use to discern both good and evil. By reason of use to discern both good and evil. I believe that the church today is consumed with a lot of pragmatic issues. Day-to-day -day issues that we do not have time for doctrinal issues. And it is our ignorance of doctrinal issues that make the church unstable, unsound, and uncoordinated. I want to repeat that. The church today is consumed with a lot of day-to-day -day issues, pragmatic issues that we do not have time for doctrinal issues. And it is our ignorance of doctrinal issues that make the church unstable, unsound, and uncoordinated. In 2 Timothy Chapter 4, 3 to 4, 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4. For the time will come when people will not put up wheat, will not endure sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires. In other words, you know, I don't desire that. It doesn't meet my need. It's not pragmatic enough. That is not what I'm going through. I need a word to talk about what I'm going through right now. I don't need any doctrinal thing. To suit their own preferences. Their own desires. Look at it. Then they will gather around them a great number of teachers. To say what their itching ears want to hear. All right? So, no, 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 let me look for a minister. Let me look for a pastor. Let me look for a church where they are talking about current things. Where they are talking about things that will meet my need. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. The pre-COVID church is a church that is being controlled by the needs of men. It is the aggregate of the needs of men that the pastors combine together to preach. So it is priestly and not prophetic. They will turn their ears away from the truth. And turn aside to myths. Take note of this. The pre COVID church is like a juvenile church, stuck in sensualism, attractiveness, and desirability. We look for something that attracts us. We do things that will attract people. We do things that people desire. We look for our desire. In other words, we're sensual. The pre covid church is stuck in sensationalism. Looking for immediate solution and success. Four steps to breakthrough. Four steps to success. First step, steps to marital breakthrough. All right? Sensationalism. Immediate gratification. Immediate solution. And that's why people are consumed with signs and wonders because they, they want immediate answer. And signs and wonders are not for believers. Signs and wonders are for unbelievers so that they will become believers and then they begin to grow in the knowledge of God. The pre covid church was stuck in rationalism, human reasoning. It has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, you know, I don't come again. If it doesn't make sense, you know, I just, I just cut my mind off. That's why some people, they can be in the church and say, well, the message doesn't make sense. They will just 
go on, you know, social media. They'll be testing in the church. Or they go around, you know, looking for things. Or playing with, with children. Because they believe that it's not rational enough. It doesn't make sense. The pre-COVID church was stuck in situationalism. Bending the word as situation demands. In other words, the word of God is here. Instead of aligning with the word, then people take the word to meet the need of people, bend it to what people are going through. Instead of exegetical preaching, they're going to exegetical preaching. Making the word of God to fit. Instead of going to the original intent of the word and drawing practical, you know, steps from there. The church was stuck in experientialism. Experientialism. Turning personal experiences into doctrines. People will just look at what they have experienced. They say, well, I went through this situation, and uh, well, I did one, two, three, four, five things, all right? And, uh, you know, that, 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 that turned me around, and then uh, I, I make that as a condition for you. Then write books around the five things. And make that a prescription for everybody to follow. All right? How you can meet with God. How you can do this, how you can do that. And, and they are just, you know, parading their experiences and making that as doctrine. And that's why you see some people practice that and they fail. And because the church is stuck in all these isms, we cannot readily access the now world. The now world, what God is saying to the church. There are some, there are some th people now, you know, what I'm talking about, I've been, I've, this series I'm doing right now is foreign to them. Pastor, this is not what you're supposed to be talking about. This is COVID pandemic. You're supposed to be talking about how, how to feel right. How to, how to manage. How not to fear. And so, God knew about COVID before COVID existed. And COVID will now, will now you know, determine what God will say to the church. There is a message that God is sending to the church. But the people cannot, you know, access the now world because the church is now being run by the desires of men. By the issues of men. Let me say this. Listen very well. The church has been stylishly and smartly made to believe that the only reason for serving God is for our needs. The pre church. The church has been stylishly and smartly made to believe that the only reason for serving God, the only reason for praying, the only reason for worshiping God is for our needs. But let me tell you this. But beyond our need is his will. Beyond our need is his will, which is the essence of sonship. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. Oh, there is something that God has written about your life, about your home, about your ministry, about your business in the scriptures. And you have to find it. Jesus Christ got to the temple one day and the book was given to him. The Torah was given to him. And he found in the place something said by prophet Isaiah. That the spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the meek. To bind the broken hearted. To preach deliverance to the captive. The opening of prison to those that are bound. And to proclaim the year of God's favor. And the Bible says 
when he discovered himself in the book, he closed it. And he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled. I have found myself in the book. There is something for you in the book. Find it. That is the now word of God for you. Let me say this. The needs of men are adequately provided for in the will of God for man. Oh, hallelujah. The needs of men are adequately provided for in the will of God for man. I want to repeat that. The needs of men are adequately provided for in the will of God for man. And the challenge is that the will of God must be known. The will of God must be submitted to and then actualized by faith. Oh, hallelujah. The will of God is not on the surface. You have to find it. That is the challenge. You have to find that will. Number two, you have to submit to that will because the will of God might be very, very different from your will. Jesus Christ said, Father, my will is that this cup should pass over me. But quickly, he shifted. He said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, he discovered God's will. He submitted to God's will. That is the challenge. Many of us, we don't want to discover God's will because we don't want to do it. Because we, we have our own mind. And we know that the will of God will take us far away from that mind. So we behave as if we don't know. The Bible says, after they have known him as God, they do not glorify him as God. You have to know God's will. You have to submit to God's will. And because God's will is totally different from your will, you will need faith to accomplish God's will. You will need faith. You cannot do it by your ordinary mind. You need faith. That's why the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. This thing I'm telling you right now is the reason why charlatans have come to the pulpit. Because they have made people to believe that the only reason is for people's need to be met. And people also like it so. All they want is for their need to be met. So charlatans, they will go and use voodoo, they will go and do something, create testimonies, go out and sort of things, so that their needs will be met. And that is the only thing they want. And so they, they, can, they can go away with it. Even Satan can come to the pulpit in man's form and speak as God. And people would, would just say, hallelujah. Because they learn discernment. They lack it. They lack discernment. The needs of men are adequately provided for, I want to repeat that, by the will of God for man. The word of God is the compendium of God's will. The word of God is the compendium of God's will. Everything about you is in this world. Your life, your marriage, your ministry. The word of God talks about everything. It is the compendium of God's will. So as you read and study the word with an open heart, oh my shadori kalaba, you read and study the word not with a premeditated heart, but an open heart. You want God to speak to you. Over time, as you read, you'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. As you read from Genesis to Revelation, you begin to see what God has said about, you know, the responsibility of a good wife, the responsibility of a good husband, the responsibility of a pastor, the, res the responsibility of a boss, the responsibility of an employee. God has put everything in this world. And as you begin to read it, over time, you be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. His will will swallow up your will. Like the rod of Moses swallowed up the rod of the magicians. 
The will of God will swallow up your will. Your diabolic will. Your stout will. Your corny will. All right? Your selfish will. The absolute will of God, truth personified, will swallow up everything. And the only option you have is to do his will as he wills. Because when you started, there are two wills. But now, as you dwell in the world, you have only one will. The will of God has swallowed up your will. Your will has been lost in God's will. Hallelujah. And so the only one you have now is the will of God. Can, can I have a shout of amen where you are? Hallelujah. God taught me something in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 9, 15 to 20. I, I want you to pay attention to that. 1 Samuel 9, 15 to 20. You know the story about, you know, Saul, the servant, and the donkeys that were, that were missing. And they were looking, you know, for, for the donkey for, for some days. And, uh, you know, they could not find in all the cities around. And Saul looked at the servant and said, hey, man, we have to go back home. Because if you don't go back home now, the our father will not be concerned with the donkeys anymore. He will be concerned about us. But the servant said, okay, uh, dad, you know, uh, you know, Saul, don't let us go now. Let's look for a man of God. Let's look for a man of God. And there is a man of God in this city. He is an honorable man. Let's go and look for him. Let's, let's, let's ask from him. He is a seer of God. And the Bible says that, you know, before they came to Saul, uh, Samuel, God has already spoken to Samuel. Look at this. Now the Lord has told Samuel in the hair, the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time, listen, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. Saul was looking for a lost donkey. <laughs> God has a program, an agenda of emancipation for his people. Problem, donkey, purpose, deliverer. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is. The man of whom I spoke to you, this one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for the donkeys, oh, people of God, pay attention to this. For, but as for the donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. Oh. <laughs> do not be anxious about the donkeys anymore. They have been found. That problem has been solved. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? It's not on you, is it not on you? And on all your father's house, wow. He was looking for donkeys and God said, hey, that has been found. You are the one God is looking for. You are God's agenda for Israel. While he was going about the pragmatic issue, God was trying to solve the purpose issue. Oh my God. See, most of the time, God has gone past what is on your agenda. I want to repeat that. Most of the time, God has gone past what is on your agenda. That problem, that challenge, that issue that you are talking about, that you are fasting and praying about, that you don't, you, you don't have time to read the scripture about. Because your life, everything about your life has been reduced to that problem. God has gone past it to his own agenda. 
The challenge is that because we are yet to see what God is doing, we often pitch our tents on the challenges we face and make them the qualifier for flowing with God's agenda. Because, you know, you know Saul has not seen that the donkeys were, you know, were, 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 were seen, were found. It could not resonate with God's agenda. Most of the times we pitch the tent of our lives on our challenges that we cannot even see what God has in store for us. Some people will say, Lord, if you don't do mine, I won't do yours. Some people will say, God, you have to make me glad before I can serve you with gladness. And some people will say, well, you have to prove to me that you are real before I can speak about you to the world. In other words, they have pitched their tent and said, God, until you do this, I'm not going to move an inch into your purpose. You have to solve this to prove to me that you are God. God is God. He has nothing to prove to you. It's either you believe or not. Let me tell you this. You are surrounded by clouds of witnesses. That the Bible says that some of them prayed until they died. They did not receive that promise, but they kept to their faith. So if you tell God, I'm going to lose my faith, I'm not going to follow you until you do this, they'll just be looking at you. And God will tell you, I am God. Like I always say, if you give God an ultimatum, it will make sure that your ultimatum, you know, it lasts. To prove you, to you that he is God. Beloved, I am bold in God to proclaim that God has moved on past COVID-19. I want to repeat that. God has moved on past COVID-19. Like God has moved on from the donkeys and he's looking for a man to deliver his people. So God is now looking for the dwelling man. That is what God is looking for. God is looking for the dwelling man. Who is this man? He is the carrier of his presence. Who is this man? He is the lifetime student of the oracles. Who is this man? He is the revealer of God's image. Who is this man? He is the embodiment of the communicable attributes of God. Who is this man? He is the demonstrator of his power. Who is this man? He is the possessor of covenant intelligence. Who is this man? He is the fulfiller of God's mandate to be fruitful, to replenish, to multiply, to subdue, and to have dominion. For only a dwelling man can be a fruitful man. That is the man God is looking for. The possessor of covenant intelligence. You know there are some people, they are very intelligent in wickedness. They are very intelligent in wickedness. Very intelligent in wickedness. Sometimes you look at somebody and, say, and, you, and you call yourself a Christian and you can scream this against your husband and you can scream this against your wife and you can scream this you know, against your parents. You wonder where they got the idea from. But there are some people they are very intelligent in the covenant. Oh, Baralot, Eprali. Like the children of Issachar, they can pick divine signal. They can decode divine code. Like Daniel was able to do. The dwelling man. The, the king had a problem, and Daniel went to the presence of the Lord. And he told the king, he said, there is a God in heaven. What your astrologers and magicians cannot do, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets to the dwelling man. <laughs> the secret place is the place where the dwelling man got the revelation of things to come. And those are the men that God is looking for. So you must discern when God has moved past your agenda. This is a message you must not toy with. You must discern. Because many of us, we just pray, you know, from 40 days, you go to 100 days. You go, and God said, you know, I've moved past this. 
You must discern when God has moved past your agenda into his own agenda and make the switch in a heartbeat. Secure your request with thanksgiving. Oh, Bralida. Secure your request with thanksgiving. After you have prayed and you have, you have, you have decreed in his presence, say, Father, I thank you. All right? Because this matter is solved. All right? These donkeys are found. All right? You know, I got my job already. All right? I got my husband already. I got my wife already. Lord, I thank you. I give you all the glory. You secure, you know, your request with thanksgiving. Not only that, you secure your request with radical conviction. You secure it with radical, because the enemy will want to try you. Say, well, you have been praying. You said you have prayed, you have fasted, and nothing has happened. You say, devil, shut up your mouth. Just, just, like, just like, you know, uh, uh, Mesha, Shadrach, and Abednego did to King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was harassing them. He said, hey, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace if you don't bow down. But these people, they have secured their, their faith by radical conviction. They said, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter because we know that our God that will serve day and night is able to deliver us from your fiery furnace. But they said, if he will not deliver us, that is the problem. That is the dimension that the pre-COVID church lacked. Pre-COVID church is one-way traffic. God, if you don't do it, I'm done. But these people, even in the old covenant, they said, we know that God is able to do it. But we know that he is a sovereign God. All right? In his attributes, he is sovereign. That is the attribute that he will not share with any mortal man. So we don't know what God will do. But even if he will not deliver us, we are not going to bow. Radical conviction. Not only that, Secure, secure it with covenant practices. Oh, hallelujah. I, 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 pray you, I, I, pray, I pray you understand this. You secure it with covenant practices, personal covenant. And engage yourself with God's higher calling for your life. Somebody, you're looking at me, there is a higher calling for your life. Just like Saul was battling with donkeys, there was a higher calling for his life, to be the king over Israel, God's people, to give them deliverance. God said, I have heard their cry. He was running after donkeys, looking for donkeys, but God said, hey, you are a deliverer. I have a higher assignment for you. Forget about that. That has been solved, okay? Move into my agenda for you. I call this total abnegation and abandonment to God's sovereignty. Total abnegation and abandonment to God's sovereignty. And say, God, I abandon my life in your hand. And I know you cannot waste my life. I abandon my future into your hand. Lord, I know you cannot waste my life. Even if you tell me to pack up everything and follow after you, I will do. I know you cannot waste my life. In fact, Fanny Crosby the prolific American hymn writer got it right in the second stanza of uh, her famous song, I Am Dying, O Lord. He said, Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. By the power of grace divine, let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in dying. He said, Lord, let my will be lost in dying. Oh, let that be your covenant mindset today. That, Lord, let my will be lost in dying. In fact, where you are now, I want you to repeat that with me three times. Lord, let my will be lost in dying. Come on, say it. Come on, say that again. Lord, let my will be lost in dying. Come on, say it. Come on, say it for the last time. I say, Lord, let my will be lost in dying. And I have a prophetic release for somebody here today. There is somebody that God is saying to like Saul, I have moved you past the level of your search. I have raised you beyond your imagination. I have promoted you in your clan. 
I have secured for you a new future. And I'm bringing you into a new prophetic company to educate you in my purpose for you. I want to repeat that. I have moved you past the level of your search. I have raised you beyond your imagination. I have promoted you in your claim. I have secured for you a new future. And I'm bringing you into a new prophetic company to educate you in my purpose for you. If you are that man, just receive it by saying amen. So it is time to go back to the Bible. It is time to go back to the Bible. Read and study it from Genesis to Revelation. I can't say that enough. It is time for you to go back to the Bible and read it from Genesis to Revelation. And win yourself from the juvenile mindset stuck on the mundane and vanity of this world. And begin to embrace and endure sound doctrines. See, every time you reread the scriptures, you do it at a higher level. I want to repeat that. Every time you reread the scripture, you read it at a higher level. It's like you, you are laying up layers. The first time, familiarization tour. The second time, all right, you are laying on what you have read before. The third time, you are laying on what you have you know, you've read the second time, all right? And, and so you are getting new revelation. You are growing higher and higher in the things of God. You begin to see hidden things ordained for your new level of glory. And you begin to have the revelation of God's descriptions and views. How God describes things. You begin to call it the way God calls it. And listen to this word of wisdom deposited in my spirit. What makes the dwelling man unique? Pay attention to this. What makes the dwelling man unique is that he has eaten into the very soul of the scriptures. He has eaten into the very soul of the scriptures and has harmed himself with God's description of things to commune accurately in his presence without offering strange fires. When you go to God's presence with wrong descriptions, you are not communicating, you are just talking. When you go before the Lord with your own description of things, you are just, you are just, you are just talking, you are not communicating to God. Because God must talk to God. It is what God has said that you have to return back to him. God will not commune with you on what the word is saying. God's communion with you is based on what he has said in his word. Oh, I want to repeat that. You cannot go before the presence of the Lord and be arguing philosophy of man. God will not even pay attention to you. You have to harm yourself with what God has said in his word, and he will commune with you in the secret place of thunder. We talked about God's description of himself, God's description of his word, God's description of man. I talked about that last week, and I want to end this message that way. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 4 to 6. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. For the living know that they will die. No matter what you do, you will die one day. And when you die, your love, your hatred, your envy will perish with you. And that's why in Mark eleven twenty-five 25 to 26, 
the word of God says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. For your father in heaven will forgive you if you forgive men their trespasses. But if you don't do it, neither will your heavenly father forgive you your own trespasses. And I said this golden statement last week that those who refuse to forgive those who have offended them live on dangerous ground, taking a great risk on their eternal state. What if you die suddenly? Or the person you refuse to forgive dies with no opportunity for reconciliation. Your breath is in your nostril. You are at the mercy of your last breath. And that could happen any moment. So take note of this apostolic warning. I have three for you. Pay attention to your screen. Number one, <laughs> since you don't know when that day will come, avoid venting your anger frequently for a lengthy period. It is unbiblical, it is unethical, and unhealthy. Right? It's like, it's like nurturing poison or toxin in your body, carrying waste in your body without passing it out. It is toxic. It is unhealthy. All right? Somebody has offended you. Three hours, 24 hours, seven days, one year, two years, three years. You're just going to fall down and die one day. Because it is unbiblical, unethical, and unhealthy. The Bible says that do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That means it should not survive a day. That's what the Word of God is saying. Your anger should not survive a day. He said, be angry, but do not sin. The Lord gave me this revelation in Psalm 30, verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5. He said, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. And the Lord told me that the anger of a dwelling man, the man that feeds on God's word, lasts only for a moment. And his favor lasts a lifetime. The word of God softens a stony heart and turns it to a heart of flesh malleable in the direction of God's precept. That's why the Bible says you should get rid of bitterness, get rid of rage, get rid of anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. He said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God has forgiven you. Forgiven you. You want to follow what the Word of God says. You know, there are some people, their anger is for a lifetime. But their favor is for a moment. But the Word of God says, your favor should be for a lifetime. Doing good to all men for a lifetime, but your anger should be for a moment. If somebody says, I'm sorry, let it go. And if you don't say, I'm sorry, for your own sake. Because you are harboring the poison. It's like you are harboring a poison and you are looking onto another person to fall down and die. You are the one that will die. So avoid venting your anger frequently for a lengthy period. I want to repeat that. It is unbiblical, unethical, and unhealthy. Number two. Because if you continue for, for long, you begin to have health issues. High blood pressure. And don't, don't let me mention the rest. You, you, just, you just grow yourself old. Because when you are angry, you, 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 are not, you are not handsome. You are ugly. Number two. Avoid refusal to change your relationship with trespassing believers despite their repentance and change of heart towards God. Yes, they have sinned against you and they have said, well, I've, you know, I've confessed to God, he has forgiven me, all right, and I've said, sorry, I'm sorry to you. Let it go. Change your attitude. Don't say no, 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 
hmm, you don't know the gravity of what you have done. No, no, no. After God has forgiven me and I'm saying sorry too, avoid refusal to change your relationship. Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 to 11, but if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to you alone, but to me. But in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you, sufficiently for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority so that on the contrary you should rather forgive and comfort him otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow wherefore i urge you to reaffirm your love for him for to this end also i wrote so that i might put you to test whether you are obedient in all things but one whom you forgive anything i forgive also for indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage will be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. When you refuse to change your attitude to somebody that God has forgiven, that has offended you, but you refuse to forgive, the enemy will take advantage of you. The enemy will take advantage of you. It's, you are playing into the hands of the enemy. Who are you? Your breath is in your nostril. And God who is the Almighty said, I have forgiven. He said, that sin, I will never bring it into remembrance. But you, the sin is, is ever written in your mind. Release people. You need the grace of Joseph. Look at what his brother did to him. He was put, you know, they lied against him. He was put into the pit, all right? They sold him. They put him in prison. Look at all they did. But in Genesis 15, 19 to 21, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. I pray that somebody will get the revelation of this. He said, Do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day. To save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Go and do likewise. All right. Yeah, yeah, the person has done evil to you. The group of people have done evil to you. You are not in the place of God. Forgiveness is leaving people into the hand of God to do what is necessary. And if God says, yeah, I'm going to spare them. If God says, I'm going to promote them. Then what is your business? If God is promoting you. Number three. Which is the last one. Avoid putting your trust in man. Instead, learn and practice putting your trust in God alone. Avoid putting your trust in man. Instead, learn and practice. That is the word. Practice putting your trust in God alone. Jeremiah chapter 17, 5 to 11 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Whose heart departs from the Lord. In other words, when you put your trust in man, your heart will begin to depart from the Lord. You cannot put your trust in man and be, you know, in God's camp at the same time. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the past places in the wilderness. You begin to get less than God's best. In a short land which is not inhabited, blessed, happy, Fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For it shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when it comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. As I end, take note of these words. Trust in man blinds you to the many-sided goodness of God. You will never see when good comes. If you trust in man, many-sided goodness, because God can reach you from any side. And you shift your heart from the creator 
to the creature when you trust in man, which is a form of idolatry. When you shift your trust from the creator to a creature, that is idolatry. The he that dwells is the man who trusts only in the Lord. A man anxious for nothing. A man who will not cease from yielding fruits. May you be that man. May you be that woman. That you put your trust in the Lord, not in your uncle, not in your husband, not in your wife, not in your boss, not in a country. No, 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 no. Not in a government. No, 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 no. You put your absolute trust in the Lord. It took COVID-19 to disabilize the government of the world. Just COVID-19. In Psalms 112, 1-7-8, Blessed is the man, enviable is the man, that delighted greatly in his commandments, in his word. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Uh, 40,000 people died last week of COVID-19. You'll just be hearing it. It will not come to my dwelling. No, it's not going to happen to me. Why? The Bible says he is not afraid of evil tidings. Some people, when they hear that, the, the, the blood prayer will rise up and they begin to pray. Fasting. And they'll be speaking nonsense. Because they are praying out of fear. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. My heart is fixed in the Lord that it is well with me. I shall not die but live to declare the goodness of God. Trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. In conclusion today, the world order is crumbling. The world system is failing. The government of this world, iron mixed with clay, is collapsing. The intelligence tier of the world is failing. Money is losing its value and power. Only those whose trust is in the immutable God and his unchanging word will stand. In this season, we need the grace to trust him more. In this season, we need to learn to trust him more. In this season, we need covenant practice to trust him more. Like Daniel did. Covenant practice is you refuse to seek for help. You refuse to run to human beings for help. You say, Lord, it's me and you. I believe that you are going to do it for me. Daniel did that in chapter 1. He said, I'm not going to defy myself with the king's meat. Just give me pause and it's going to be well. He proved that it worked. In Daniel 2, 13 to 19, the king dreamt and he wanted to kill all the magicians and all the wise people in Babylon. Daniel said, just give me, just give me, just give me a time. He went before the Lord, he prayed with his company, and the Lord revealed the secrets. He said, yeah, I can do it. In chapter 3, all right, the king built a, a fiery furnace. And the people said, because they have been gathering strength. They have been gathering strength by covenant practice. They said, well, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we are not capable to answer you in this matter. The Lord is able to deliver us. And God sent an angel, the fourth man in the fire, and delivered them. And they said, ah, yeah, we can do it. In chapter 4, the king dreamed another thing. At this time, the king did not even call the astrologers. He just said, I know there is a man in this kingdom. Daniel. You know, the Lord revealed secret to him. Daniel revealed that secret. Hallelujah. He gathered strength. In chapter 5, Belshazzar dreamed. And God wrote something on the world. Because he has gathered, you know, strength by covenant practice. The Bible says, it said God is able to, to interpret this thing for you. He interpreted it for the king and said, wow. In chapter 6, he gathered strength. In chapter 6, the people said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we cannot catch him, but only in his God. And the Bible says when they did that, uh, Daniel said, okay. He opened the window. 
and he was he was he was praising the Lord. He was he was praying, and he said, "Huh?" Because he has gathered strength by covenant practice. And Daniel seven to twelve, God said, "All right, I'm going to show you things to come. I'm going to give you the revelation of the seventy weeks. We still call it seventy weeks of Daniel today. Let me tell you this: when you begin to practice, you begin to practice." Hallelujah. That, that's the problem we had in pre-COVID church. People cannot even exercise their faith. He said, by reason of use, you exercise to believe God for greater things to come. All the glory of a sensational church is at the mercy of a single storm. All the glory of a sensational church is at the mercy of a single storm. Every experience that does not have a doctrinal foundation will not last. It is time for the church to be weaned from the juvenile level, become skilled in the world of righteousness, and have our senses exercised to discern both good and evil at this perilous time. Let's move from the juvenile level to the mature level, where we begin to exercise our muscles, we begin to exercise, you know, covenant intelligence, and we begin to move into God's purpose for us because it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Hallelujah. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take Him at His word just to To make the right adjustment when you speak to me. I do not want to waste your word. Also, please help me to get into new realm through your word that you have sent to me to bring me peace. You want to say, Lord, I declare that is the last prayer. I have 15 prayers here. You will get those prayer points. The last one, Lord, in your name, I declare that I am a dwelling man. In fact, wherever you are, say after me, I am a dwelling man. Say, I have life. Say, I have rest. Say, I have joy. Say, I have peace. Come on, repeat that. I declare that I am a dwelling man. So, I have life. I have rest. I have joy. I have peace. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you. We give you praise for your word that has come to us, oh God. Lord, I pray that you give us the grace oh God, to respond to that word. Are there people hearing me now that they have put their, their trust in man? They have put their trust in themselves. I pray that in the name of Jesus, you give them the grace to make that switch today. Salvation is removing your trust from yourself and placing that trust on the atoning work of Jesus. I want to say, Jesus, I remove my trust from myself. I remove my trust from my friends. I remove my trust from this word. I now put my trust in you for eternal life. I now put my trust in you for everything that I need. Oh Lord, I receive that grace today. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not by yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And as many that are calling upon your name right now, Lord, I pray that they shall be saved. Save me, O oh Lord, and I shall be saved. Heal me, O oh Lord, and I shall be healed. O oh Lord, I pray that you, the Lord, will give all of us the grace to trust you more. Give all of us the grace to learn more to trust you. Give us the grace 
to engage in covenant practice to build up our faith muscle so that we can be all you want us to be to our world. Give us the grace not to be stuck in our challenges. Give us the grace to be able to discern when you have moved to your agenda. Give us the grace, oh God, to flow with you so that our will will be lost in that. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. One more time. Bless the Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust. It is so sweet. Come. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. trust you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you.